Hello and welcome. It's Friday. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. Beyond the Darkness is on the air. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. Tim Dennis will be back with me next week. Running strong and proud. We'll have an entire week with Tim in studio doing the show where he belongs. Thank you all again for your uh, continued prayers and thoughts and positive energy and light and messages you're sending to Tim. It is having a definite impact in him and on him. So thank you for doing that and, and being part of his world. You can always email him words of encouragement to, to Tim at darknessradio.com. Tim at darknessradio.com. A little later on, we've got a personal tale in the theater of the mind, so stay tuned for that. But joining me tonight, this is really kind of exciting because I've been talking about this on and off for years on the show, and I had an experience back in 2006. I heard on Coast to Coast, this little radio show, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, pretty big show, uh, number one overnight talk radio show in the world, and I was listening to George Norrie interview a gentleman by the name of James Gillilan. And James threw out this ridiculous claim that if you came to his property on a clear night, you would have a 90 to 95% chance of seeing UFO activity. And he invited anyone. He said, you don't have to take my word for it. Put me to the challenge. So I did. And I went out there and I had an experience, one that still lingers with me today We'll talk about that during Theater of the Mind. I re- returned there, I think, a total of four times and had unbelievable things happen. And it is truly one of the most bizarre locations I've ever been to uh, where it comes to uh, regular occurrences of, of paranormal activity, strange activity. And uh, our good buddy Jimmy Church, also one of the fill-in hosts on Coast to Coast AM, had a chance recently to go to the Assetti Ranch and be there and witness for himself what's going on. So joining us now, not only is he the fill-in host of Coast to Coast AM, he's also the host of Fade to Black. He's here back with us. He was back in April. He's back now. Jimmy, welcome back to the show. Thanks for joining us. Big Dave. This Big place Dave. is crazy, Jim. Am I am I right? I got to tell you, um, I, it was a bucket list forest uh, to get finally get up to Eseti. And just like you, I've interviewed James uh, over the years and just recently had him on coast, oddly enough, a couple of months ago. And, you know, so we we finally made it up there. And I was I was warned in a in a positive way. Get ready, man. That place is nuts. We've been there many times. And. I was warned, and I, I'm just going to say this out of the gate, even though it was my first time there. Uh, the second my feet hit the ground, I felt something going on. It was like really, really weird. Now, yes, the UFO activity, all of that, it, you get that in spades. It's it's just all night long, every night. You know this, and, and we'll get to some of that in, in just a bit. But um, it's everything else there, too, as well. There's just crazy things going on. And if you are somebody looking for uh, enlightenment or, you know, a change in yourself and you just want to go and experience uh, uh, an epiphany, right, (laughs) just go. That's the place you will you will find what you seek there and i and and i went through oddly enough and we'll get uh, we'll get to the video in the opening here in just a bit but we went through the orientation that ashley does at the uh, conference room and I, i'm sitting there and this, is, this is on thursday and she's talking about fairies and parallel worlds and bigfoot and it, 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 just just things and i'm just i'm not quite rolling my eyes but it's just that it's too much, right? It's just way too right. much. Sure enough, man, the dominoes started falling. <laughs> it all happened. 
fairies, parallel worlds, missing items, things. I, I, I stepped into dimensions. It was crazy, and it was a lot of fun. It was an e-ticket at Disneyland for sure. And then uh, the Thursday night rolls around, and we, um, just like everybody, when you first get to East Eddie, Mount Adams dominates your vision it's right. it's everywhere you go this mountain is looking down on top of you it's 13 miles away and yet it is right there it is just it's, so you take pictures and i took a bunch of pictures on that thursday it was it was just beautiful and majestic and i'm posting them and having fun okay so we go through thursday night we have uh, the sky watch and Again, you know, things are appearing in the sky and on the mountain, and we had a lot of fun. It was an extraordinary experience. Friday morning rolls around, and I go out to the medicine wheel. I'm shooting video, and there's about 150 people up there at this point uh, rolling in. And uh, we go out to the medicine wheel, and uh, uh, oh, 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 let me back up. So Thursday night, I'm on uh, ground Zero with uh, Clyde Lewis live from the ranch. And Clyde says <laughs> live on the air, okay, Jimmy, man, okay, just get ready. We'll check in with you tomorrow. But it's, stuff is going to start to happen. And you know Clyde, and we, you know, we laugh about it. But once again, right, you get that warning. <laughs> Things are going to happen. So anyway, so Friday rolls around. I jump out into the field, and I go out to the medicine wheel, and I shooting a video, the medicine wheel and, and panoramic shots. And, and I go out and I shoot Mount Adams at that moment. I walk back to the observation area and, you know, in front of uh, James's uh, observatory there. And I walk back and one of the attendees who I'd met the night before, his name is uh, John, John Esch. He's there with his family. They got the Winnebago, right? And literally a Winnebago. And he comes up to me and he says, hey, I think I found a door that just opened on Mount Adams. And I was like, what? Now, the rumors, as you know, about a hangar door opening and UFOs uh, coming in and out and objects. This has been reported for years. I've talked to James about it. You've heard the stories and watched the videos. And they're very compelling and they're fun to watch. But it's never been seen officially like a door opening you see objects coming in and out of the mountain but you don't see the the door right quote unquote i'm doing air quotes here in the bunker and so i grab his binoculars and he points and i look and sure enough there is this massive opening on the top of mount adams now i i, I after i saw this and I'm I'm kind of freaking out because it it is exactly what John said he saw this massive opening. I go back to my phone at this moment and I look at my pictures that I took the day before. It's not there. And and I and I I taken a couple of dozen pictures of the mountain from different angles and it's clearly not there. And the pictures that I had taken were you know, a half hour apart, hour apart throughout the day. So it wasn't the sun. It wasn't a weird shadow. I'm talking about the, the pictures the day before, like it was being masked or anything. It just wasn't there. So uh, we go back, and then I shoot a second video, which is in the video everybody can go and see. Uh, just go to our website. I'm sure you have it posted up on, on Beyond the Darkness, but if you don't, you should. And, and just get it up there for everybody because – the second video, you see the videos that I shoot in order. So the first video, I, I don't mention the door, right? <laughs> a few minutes later, I'm freaking out, and so is everybody else. And I shoot the second video, and then for the next four days, Dave, we shoot this thing. We videotape. Um, we did everything that we could to get different angles, close-ups, in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, uh, it, it stays daylight up there until nine, ten o'clock at night, which is, uh, you know, a fun thing to see too as well. At nine o'clock at night, this uh, this mountain is still clearly lit up, and it never went away. It it never went away. the The observations that I made uh, first out of the gate uh, were ones of shock and awe. I was still a little bit beside myself, and I get that. 
Um, but my first observation, it looked like there were tracks coming out of this door. Um, it looked like there was so, uh, some type of, uh, uh, I don't want to say road. I called it a driveway, um, but but something leading up to the entrance for sure. Um, now, uh, later, uh, through all of the observations that we have made, and with everybody there, to just hundreds of witnesses, the um, it looks like there's it's leaking, like maybe debris is coming out of it. It's clearly an entrance. Uh, it could be a natural cave that has been exposed. It could be that. It could be something else. I don't know if it's man-made or alien but what is the most interesting thing of all of this is clearly there is a massive opening on the top of Mount Adams. And it's it's huge. It's not a play on the eyes. It's not anything else. It is an entrance. I, I just don't know how that entrance was made. We do know that it's a volcano. Mount Adams is a, is a volcano. It's had lots of activity. Um, so is this connected with that? I, again, I don't know, but it's on the top of the mountain. It's not in the middle. It's not on the bottom and it's not, uh, some play of shadows. It is clearly, uh, an opening and it's massive. My guess is that, uh, and you've seen the video, my guess, the mountain is, you know, almost it's 12,300 foot tall from sea level it's about eight to 9,000 feet from there, from ground level up to the top. And, and it's 13 miles away. So when you're looking at something that big, that massive, and then this entrance dominating that mountain, it must be a couple hundred feet across, maybe more, and a couple hundred feet tall. It's huge. It's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. What did you think when you saw it first? Well, I've been hearing, right, and, and I've been there uh, numerous times. I've heard about these mysterious portals that'll open on the volcano, and that and, and the claims have been made that it's part of their underground base. It's where the UFOs go. And here's here's the f- very strange issue I have when I visit there. I witness things. I see them. I see things for myself that I cannot explain away. And every time James makes another claim, I look at him like, how high are you? That sounds ridiculous. There's no way. And then something else happens. So right. I, I live in this constant state of disbelief, yet I know. blown away by what you're actually experiencing. So I'd heard of these doors and portals. That sounded so far out to me that, yeah, okay, what Dr. Evil from Alien Land is going to fly into these uh, volcanoes and, and use it. And I, I couldn't I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Then to see the video and the photographs... Again, what what in God's green earth are we looking at now? Is it is it something natural in effect, and something happened, and and you know rock fell away, and it created this opening on a volcano? There's that possibility, but after years of hearing about these doorways opening and closing, it's it's pretty hard to just dismiss it as uh, fantasy, and <laughs> and and it's pretty uh, pretty remarkable uh, imagery and and footage. So kudos to you. That that's. Uh, you know, that, again, that's part of the strange enigma of the Assetti Ranch. You, you... Yeah. I have a list of things that happened. Okay, I'm going to share a couple of quick stories with sure. you. I'll well, make. Well, them... Let me. I, I want to ask you this real quickly first yes. before we get in. Now, see, when I first got there, that first night it was um, overcast, and we're talking, James and I, and you can't see the sky that night. So obviously, I'm going to go back to my hotel. But I am watching these colored lights pulsate in the clouds over the top of Mount Adams. And science is kicking into my brain. I'm like, okay, well, you've got some low front, low barometric pressure. You've got cloud cover. You've got uh, gases escaping from the volcano. So you're probably getting some reflection and some chemical interaction. That's why you're getting these weird colors. And and he's telling me, no, that's them up in the clouds. So, you know, again, I'm kind of. I nod politely. Okay, James, I'll see you tomorrow. And I, I head back to my room and I, I sat at this hotel right down there in Charlotte, like just watching this occur. And it was, it was bizarre. These lights just, they looked massive over this volcano, this, in, in these clouds, just throbbing and pulsating all night. And, uh, then they just were off. There was nothing there. And I figured again, well, was the gas venting and now it stopped. I, I, I was trying any, any sense I could make to these things that I was watching. Um, but one of the other trips that I made there, he, he was talking about the lenticular cloud forms. 
And I hear about a lot of those over near volcanoes. But he said that they hide, the craft will hide in these um, cloud cover. And we were laughing when we got there the second time, and I'm setting up to to do sky watching with my two friends that came with me. Jimmy, I kid you not, there is a 1950s style UFO cloud. The shape, uh, it, it looks like a UFO, but it's a giant cloud in the shape of a UFO. And we're laughing, and I said, well, that's got to be the stupidest alien race to hide in a cloud that's in the shape of a UFO. And we're having this laugh, and all of a sudden, this black ball starts to undulate and pop in and out from the bottom of this UFO-shaped cloud. And the right three now. of us just stood there and looked at it, and I, I said, are you seeing this? I Look, look, Dave, this is the nutty thing. Right. The thing that you have just said to me right now, after ESETI, is not shocking at all. It, I know the audience is listening to you right. and listening to me. You know what? Go to ESETI. Right. So you can, you can come back and have your own story because it this is what goes on up there. It is crazy. Now, okay, talk about sightings. Be, I, I, um, and I said to James on his uh, radio show, I said, UFO, schmoofo. You're going to get that up here at East City, whatever, <laughs> right? It's the other things that go on there that are really, really trippy, too. And you take it all in total, and you've got an, a really amazing place that is totally magical. But let me let me share this. This is hot off the press. We um, On Friday night, after the discovery of the UFO door, Friday night, we had four nights of uh, sky watching. Three were... Okay, and we did. We saw st- stuff, but Friday night, the skies absolutely lit up, and it was like Steven Spielberg and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It was like that in the skies, and it was overwhelming and completely out of control. One, okay, there was many, many things that happened, but uh, I'll share with you three that were just stupid. Over heading northwest, over our And I love the way you say that, because for for listeners, you've got to understand, you hear this and it's impossible, it's improbable, and then you get there and you're like, there is no way I'm seeing what I'm seeing right now. So (laughs) it's funny that you refer, I say the same thing, what I saw was just stupid. (laughs) There's no way this is a real thing. This this craft comes over, and it's I'm going to say it was like 5,000 feet because you're seeing stuff in the stars all night, right? right but this right. thing comes across, and it's low, and uh, it's maybe 5,000 feet. You can almost make out a shape, and it's coming across going to the northwest. It, it, it appears from behind us. And as it gets right over the top of us, this thing lights up like a magnesium flare three feet from your face. It just bursts and lights up the ground, lights up every like a camera flash, and then continues flying. And it kind of turned uh, a, a couple of different colors and, and just went off towards Mount Adams and disappeared. Straight out of Steven Spielberg, man. It was crazy. And I'm, everybody's yelling and screaming. Now, this was naked eye stuff. Right. And I'm thinking, that was crazy. I can't, you know, and at, right after that happened, off to the west, and, and you have to picture here, everybody, in your mind's eye, it's dark, but you're so far north now, off to the west, it is still lit up. Okay? Sunset's in the west, right? And so it's still lit up. And off to the west is a star. And something catches my eye, and and I see above this, like a bright planet, but it's glowing in the blue sky. Right above us, it's black, but off to the west, it's still uh, blue and a little orange. And, And then there are two stars there, actually. One bright planet thing. And above it is another tiny star, and it, they're sitting there stationary. And I'm like, "Wow, I never, no- I never noticed that bright planet that's out there. That's really cool." And Mark Walsh, who is uh, standing in front of me, he goes, "What is that?" And I look over at Mark, and he's looking at what I'm looking at. So we turn back, and now a hundred people turn to the west, and they're all looking at what we're looking at, and it's sitting there. 
And then, and I'm not, uh, this is how it went down. This planet, this bright planet that is looking at us, suddenly flares up, bright, really bright, and then shoots off. It takes off like a dragster at, 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 <laughs> it's like Don Garlit, man. Take just, and it heads right across the horizon and, and goes due north like, like a bullet out of a gun. It's sitting there stationary, right? And we're looking at it for five, 10, 15 seconds. It flares up and then shoots off. Now, somebody help me here, right? I, I am tripping. And I'm watching this. <laughs> I'm just, I'm like, this, this is crazy talk, right? And and then a few minutes after that, uh, this other object again appears from behind us in the trees, goes across us, and it's it's flashing, it's flashing, and it flashed thirty times, thirty, uh, about a second apart, uh, you know, just doing this flash. Flash, flash, flash. And I'm yelling with the crowd. Uh, they're all going, Jimmy, tell it to flash again. All right, flash again. And <laughs> flash again. Flash again. Do it for flash. 30 times in a row. Now, I don't care. And this was a, a white ball right. that just kept relighting. I don't care where you go in the country. Walk outside. Look up in the sky and tell me that you have ever seen something just fly overhead, light you up like a camera flash, and then take off. You've, I've never, you know, and if, if this was going on to our right, to our left, above, around. Mount Adams has got these objects all over the face of it and, and lighting up and moving around. It was, it was almost too much. Uh, I really, and to see, the thing is, is uh, he said he is a, it's a drug-free alcohol free restricted place so there's no partying going on there's nothing like that but let me tell you something at that moment i needed (laughs) i needed needed a shot of vodka it was it was just my heart was going to jump out of my chest now so combine all of that that is going on with this door opening up uh, and the other events that had happened in the last 24 to 48 hours, I started to figure out that e SETI is exactly what you've heard about. You know, it's all of that. It's, it's a truly magical place. Okay. So let me, let me back up. Let's get off the UFO stuff for a second. The, uh, and, and real quick, let me do make a quick mention. If any of you out there can find an episode of a uh, paranormal state, it is uh, an episode entitled First Contact. I took the, the team from Paranormal State out to investigate the Assetti Ranch. Instead yeah, you... of hunting demons, we went out UFO hunting. And a lot of what you just heard Jimmy explain is what we caught on video for the episode as it happened. People always ask me, do you think these shows are faked? I can only tell you the episodes I've been a part of, what you end up seeing is exactly what happened for us. And we had things lighting up in the sky, flashing at us, signaling us, and then it would take off like a bat out of hell. It was the most preposterous things you've ever seen. And our, my mind is still trying to wrap around, uh, trying to wrap around what exactly it was I encountered while we were out at this, uh, at this location. And this is time after time after time. But the name of the episode is Paranormal State First Contact. Go watch it. I think it's on YouTube or on A and E. You'll be able to find copies of it. It's it's a crazy episode. Yeah, Chad uh, Chad Kayla told me all about that, and uh, it's 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 crazy. Oh, oh, okay. So so check this out. Okay. Yes, UFOs. I get that. You know, and it, it's fun. But we go through the orientation, and Ashley says, "Now we have fairies here." Okay, so you're going to, something's going to show up missing, your keys, your wallet, your cell phone. Don't freak out. Just be nice. Ask the fairies to return it, and you'll get it back. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow, that's, 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 a, that's a fun story. Okay. <laughs> and so Friday rolls around. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Saturday rolls around. Uh, Friday night. Okay, I wear hardware. 
Okay, I wear hardware, rings, bracelets, watches. I'm a big watch collector, and so I wear hardware. Every night I go through the routine before I go to bed. I got to pull the hardware off, you know, set it down, and 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 go to bed. So it's Friday night, and uh, I'm, you know, taking the hardware off, and I look, and I'm missing a ring. And the ring, and it's on my ring finger on my right hand, it's impossible for me to take off. I've been doing it for years. I have to work it off my finger because I have big knuckles, crack my knuckles. But to get the ring on and off, it's an effort, right? Okay. So I'm taking, I'm like, my ring's gone. And I go up to Rita and she goes, that's impossible. And she knows, she sees me struggle with it every night. It's, you know, whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, how did that happen? I go through the car. I go through everything. Maybe I took it off already and I set it down subconsciously. It's not in the hotel room. It's not in the car. It's not in my pants pocket. It's not anywhere. Wake up in the morning, look for the ring again, can't find it. And I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. I can't believe I'm about to say this. Okay, fairies. I'm sorry. I believe. I believe. Please return the ring. It means a lot to me. And Reed is going, what? Are you serious? I said, look, we've got to. Fairies, don't listen to her. Listen to me right now. I want my ring back. Please. We get in the car. We drive over to East Eddie. I go up to Ashley and Lori and Allison are standing there in the convention center. And, and I walk up and I show them my hand with the ring. And they go, what's up? I said, what's wrong with uh, my ring's gone? And I said, I've asked the fairies to return it. I, I, I give in. This is too much. And Lori says, was it a spinner ring silver? And I said, yeah. She goes, I got it back a half hour ago. And I was, what? I had a half hour ago, I'm preaching to the fairies, right? And I'm thinking, this is too much. So I get the ring back, and I put it on, and I walk outside, and, I, and I'm and i telling everybody in the group my fairy story. Ha, 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 I got the ring back. Mark Walsh, now check this out. This is what's really weird. Mark Walsh, remember, everybody, this is a 78-acre ranch in the middle of nowhere. It's a massive place. Mark Walsh goes, dude, I found your ring. I said, what do you mean? He said, it was underneath a chair inside of the conference center. And I was sitting in that that chair the day before listening to uh, Jason quit speak. Now, somehow that ring was removed from my hand while I was sitting in that chair. And it hit the ground and rolled underneath the chair where it sat. I somebody help me out here. And I keep saying this over and over again. Somebody help me out. I need an explanation. In my mind's eye now I'm picturing like four little fairies pulling the ring off. Don't wake them up. Don't don't let them know we're doing this. Let's get the ring off. Come on, come on. Oh, he moved. Stop, stop. stop. That's that they had to I I don't know. You know, and I just I can't explain it. So there you go. You have that experience. And then we went out, uh, oh, my goodness, I think this was on Saturday. We go out to the Medicine Wheel, and uh, they were doing a, 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 a drum, uh, the singing bowls ceremony out there. So I go out, and, uh, again, I'm just trying to be cool, and I want to be part of what's going on. And we go out, and we stand in this circle uh, that's out there, everybody. It's a beautiful, like, 50-yard diameter round Indian medicine wheel made with rocks and crystals and very, very cool, very majestic. It's amazing to see. So we go out, and we're at the center of the circle, and they start the singing bowls, and Lori turns and says, okay, everybody, close your eyes, and uh, we'll see you at the end of this. Okay, so I close my eyes, and I'm standing there, and they start the singing bowls. And Dave, although I'm not going to tell you what happened, it lasted for about 15 minutes. I, I left. That's the best. That's all I'm going to say. Everything else is personal, but I left at the end of this. And when I say that I left, I departed. And at the end of the 15 minutes, uh, the singing bowl stopped. And I kind of remember that. Um, but, but anyway, I come out of this place. 
and I open my eyes, and my wife Rita is standing next to me, and I know Allison and Teresa and Lori, I know the three of them, and, and they're there. I don't recognize anybody. I don't know where I am. And I look around, and I'm tripping out because I don't recognize E. Seti. I don't know the people I'm standing there with. And, and I'm like, I want to go back. I want to go back. And I closed my eyes and I leaned over, I bent over, put my hands on my knees and I stood there and I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed and I stood back up and I opened up my eyes. I'm looking, I'm trying to get oriented again. And, and I see my wife and I see everybody and they're kind of, I, I, it was now, you hear about meditation and you hear about this and you hear about parallel worlds and, you, you know, interdimensional that you hear these stories and these experiences from others. And, and until you've done it, you don't have any connection with it. You don't understand. But I went through that. And I have to say, uh, uh, the, uh, the experience, I keep saying experience, but the opportunity to do something like that and when it does happen to you for the first time, it's, uh, it can be, uh, to, uh, almost too extraordinary to handle. And I was, I was at that point and I try to be pragmatic and, and I'm open minded, but, but I need to always keep myself in check and remain objective. And then something like that happens to you and you're like, uh, there's something going on. There's something, there is a whole nother world out there. There's a whole nother place out there that science and, and the black and white world cannot wrap their head around. They don't understand it, but it was, and, and I'm just like, he said, this is too much. It's too much. It's overwhelming. Then you go from that to another night of night vision. Right. And, right, another, and you're, you're back into the UFO loop. Of, right. of what's going on. You know, yeah. Jimmy, one of the, the weirdest things I like when you talk about it, it's not just UFOs. It's, it's not just this thing. And you mentioned earlier, this place is magical and it is. And when we were out there for, it was like, I think around a 4th of July, it was this big kind of, uh, hippie UFO fest that was taking place there. They had tents spread everywhere. Very interesting. And we came in to watch this and, uh, clouds started to fill the sky. And James came by to say hi to me. And I go, oh, it looks like we're going to get rained out or cloud cover tonight. And he goes, no, don't worry about it. It's going to clear up for us. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, James. So I start checking the weather. Nope, cloudy night, possible rain, blah, blah, blah. So I make another comment. I said, well, the, the weather channel is saying, he goes, no, don't worry about it. It's going to be clear. Okay. The weirdest and damnedest thing that I've ever seen is the fact that the sky was covered, blanketed in gray clouds, except over James Gilliland's property. <laughs> there was this perfectly punched hole that covered the entire property. And, and you could see the sky perfectly. And there was activity throughout that night. There were triangle craft. There were lights. There were beams of light. There was flashing lights. It was everything you could imagine going on. And, and the damnedest thing about this, Jimmy was as the night progressed and more and more people went off to sleep, this hole kept getting smaller. And it was probably about two o'clock in the morning. It was me and maybe a handful of other people. We all decide, well, that's it for night. We all look down from the sky. We're chatting for a few seconds and I go, well, we'll, we'll convene again tomorrow and see what the world has in store for us. We look up, not a spot of sky is visible. In that few minutes it took us to talk, this entire gap closed because nobody was paying attention anymore. It's it's so funny that when you start to absorb ESETI and what it's about, what you are saying right now is the conversations that happen between people all day long at ESETI. And you, you, you check reality at the door. Now you are okay. When somebody sits down, they go, you know what, last night... Uh, I was walking through the campsite and I looked across and I saw Bigfoot in the trees and he waved at me and I waved back and, and we did a little salute and then we, you know, and you hear it and you're like, that's cool. <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't anymore 
you know, you're not questioning somebody's sanity. Uh, you know, when somebody says, I walked out and I saw, you know, I saw this blue light in the tree and I looked up and, and it was a fairy. It was a fairy in this blue light with wings. And I took out my cell phone and I took a picture of it and it's real cool. You want to see it? Yeah, I do want to see it. And you look and there's a picture of a fairy in a blue thing. It, 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 this is what goes on there. And so everybody is sharing these stories. I'm walking around telling my stories about what I have been experiencing there. And I, I can't explain it. I, I really, really can't, but it is so much fun. You telling this story right now to me, I want the details because I know that it happened. Well, let's I know do this. We, we have to take a break. It's fascinating that you keep talking about the blue figures and fairies and things. I have a very real story and it is still one of the most impactful stories I've ever experienced. And I'm about to share that in our theater of the mind. And Jimmy, I've just shot you a picture of what is uh, described in this story. And it is an artist rendition of exactly what I saw in the skies of Resetti Ranch. So stay tuned. We've got more Jimmy Church, more about Resetti Ranch. We'll do that when we return. But right now it's time to go into the archives. This is a story from my own past, ladies and gentlemen. This is Theater of the Mind. The Biomechanical Craft, a true sighting by Beyond the Darkness host, Dave Schrader. It was early in 2006, and I was driving a long, lonely stretch of highway after a late night of hanging with friends. When I switched on my car stereo and tuned into Coast to Coast AM, I found myself locked in a compelling discussion between host George Norrie and a man by the name of James Gilliland. I listened, transfixed by the tales he would share of strange craft that would fly above his property, of dancing lights moving about his surrounding land, and his interactions with beings of alien origins. My logical mind fought to believe the unbelievable stories James would share, yet the Fox Mulder side of me wanted, no, needed to believe we were not alone, and that we were being visited. As the interview came to a close, I heard James make a statement that struck me. It was something along the lines of saying he didn't have to or need to try to convince anyone of what he was saying. He was content just knowing that it was true. Then he threw out a challenge. This was a challenge I knew I could not resist. He stated, as a simple matter of fact, that on a clear night, anyone could have a 90 to 95% chance of seeing something for themselves over the skies of Trout Lake, Washington and anyone was welcome to come put his claims to the test, to see and experience the phenomena for ourselves. I switched off the radio, turned the keys to the ignition, effectively stopping my car, and I sat there for a long moment, thinking, my mind racing with thoughts and possibilities of what I just heard. I knew without a doubt I must go to this and witness this for myself. I climbed out of my car and with a solid push shut the door and headed into the house for the night. As I lay in bed next to my wife, I explained what I had heard and told her that I needed to witness this place for myself, insisting that as an investigator, I couldn't resist a claim of 90 to 95% chance of seeing something. She could hear my passion, my desire to sate my curiosity and agreed I should make the trip. After days of poring over videos, articles, and blogs about Isetti Ranch and the strange happenings, I set on a date to go visit. I chose not to alert James of the dates, as he stated many times and in many places on the internet that the invitation was always open. Just drop on by. I did not want to clue him in that a radio host was coming, an investigator that wouldn't be so easily fooled by manipulation or tricked by sci-fi effects. I would just show up unannounced and challenge him to prove these claims. The first day I arrived, the skies were gray with clouds. I settled into the local motel and set myself up, rested a bit, and prepared myself for an evening of possibilities. After a brief, refreshing nap, I grabbed some food at a local diner and engaged the wait staff in discussion about the skies above their quiet little town. They were cheerful, polite, and more than willing to share the strange things that they had witnessed over the years, and insisted on parading cooks and dishwashers and other patrons over to my table to regale me with their stories. This was getting better and better, and my excitement was mounting. These people seemed genuine, forthcoming, and I think they believed every word they told me, one right after the other. I set off to begin my journey after enjoying a delicious home-cooked meal and bidding a fond farewell to the local diner and staff, promising that I would be back. It wasn't much of a promise, as it was the only place to eat in the small town. I drove the few miles up the road to a SETI ranch and wound my way up that road. 
I was excited. I, I couldn't wait to begin. But sadly, the, the sky stayed cloudy through the night. I spoke with James and heard of his stories, met a few other weary travelers that made their way to the world-famous UFO ranch. James told us of the strange craft that would be seen. He pointed off to the far-off but visually dominating Mount Adams volcano, where he believed there was an alien base hidden within. I fought my natural instincts to laugh or make some kind of smart-ass comment, and I just chose to just immerse myself in the experience and see what might happen. That's when we all noticed that the cloud cover near Mount Adams seemed to be teeming with life. Muted palettes of green, blues, and pink lights pulsated in the clouds nearest the volcano. That's when I heard James explain to the others that was most likely from the craft hovering above or the ones located inside the volcano. I just watched, trying to make logical sense of it all. I rationalized that the volcano most likely emitted, I don't know, some kind of natural gases and the like. Mixed it with a low pressure system, that must have been creating some kind of uh, weird heat lightning. Although I had never and have never seen that type of storm before or since. Feeling disappointed that the clouds dominated the skies, I decided to head back to my hotel. I drove slowly down the road with the windows open, listening. The crunching of the dirt road beneath my tires, hoping to hear something, anything to take away from tonight besides a weird weather system that I was convincing myself was taking place over Mount Adams. My second night was more exciting. Lights would move across the skies, then bank at extreme angles and zoom off in opposite directions. I witnessed satellites and, and the occasional space junk, but then the fast-moving, direction-changing craft. It was beginning to look a lot more promising tonight, and a small group had gathered for the evening. The sounds of oohs and ahs and hey, hey, look over there would occasionally break the silence. The only other sounds were the warming pops and crackles from the bonfire James had lit for us to sit around to warm our bones in the cool evening air. We watched on for hours in wide wonder as the lights danced and moved, flashed and raced off at breakneck speeds, and the sky show continued until well after midnight, close to four hours of pretty constant activity. Now, the skies were breathtaking. Having grown up near Chicago and then Minneapolis, I had never seen skies so rich, so dark, and filled with the beauty of trillions of stars. You could even make out the ribbon of the Milky Way. I was entranced, but still felt a little bit let down. There was nothing major that happened. No low-flying craft, no close encounters music bursting forth from the aerial pilots, just small flecks of rice racing across the black, velvety setting of the night skies over Trout Lake, Washington. The third night would become a life-changing evening for me. My hopes and expectations would be met and in some ways exceeded. Since I had had such a wonderful night before with high-flying objects of unknown origins, my expectations had lowered and become a bit more realistic. I would just be happy to see the lights skipping merrily along the magical night skies and shelve my thoughts of giant, low-flying music playing UFOs from movies. This was not the first time Hollywood expectations would disappoint me, and would not be the last time either. I arrived and James had welcomed a small gathering of people, maybe 12 to 15 of us, people from all around. A family had driven up from Alabama, there were some folks from Canada and Texas, Oregon and Michigan, and we were all together for one sole purpose, to lay witness to the extraordinary claims of James Gilliland. It didn't take long when the talking, laughter, and joking would die down and was replaced again by the sounds of the crackling bonfire, crickets chirping, and the occasional eerie hoots from a nearby owl. James informed us that the visitors had informed him telepathically that we would not be let down tonight and we would see amazing things. It was hard to hear these claims. Logic said there's no way this man is in touch with actual aliens. But his demeanor, his confidence, and level of comfort was overwhelming. He's a very kind, soft-spoken man with a generous heart and nature that easily leads you down the rabbit hole of his beliefs. We were astonished to see lower lights tonight, some the size of nickels and dimes in the sky that would fly, stop, flash, and then launch off at impossible speeds. We were promised interesting and amazing, and we were getting them. After a few hours, I had a thought that leapt to mind. We're all so busy looking in the direction of Mount Adams. I wonder what's going on behind us in the same skies. With that, I set off by myself into the great out-of-doors to position myself deep in the viewing field and turn my focus to the skies behind the others. I stood for a bit enjoying the peace, occasionally directed to look at the skies by others pointing out moving objects, when my attention was suddenly drawn to a grove 
of very tall pine trees close to the main house. I stood, I stared, and then my life changed. A large, lighted craft, I guess you could say, moved out from behind one set of trees. It swam. Yeah, I, I said it. It swam across the sky like, like a giant stingray. It glowed with a beautiful and intense iridescent blue. The light glowed from within, yet it didn't light up the sky to any noticeable degree, and nothing around it. It just fluttered and swam across the sky where it vanished behind the other tall set of trees. Now, what happened next, I can't explain. I ran with all I had towards the source of that light. My mind was racing. I bent down to grab some rocks, and I grabbed hold of one of the visitors from Alabama, insisting she come with me. I just saw a craft, I yelled. She, unlike me, was not as enthused to run towards it and insisted I let go of her. So I obliged, disheartened and hoping to share the experience with one of my fellow investigators. I continued on. I ran swiftly towards the grove of trees and began throwing the rocks as hard as I could between them, hurling stone after stone. The only sound back was the occasional thud as they would hit the ground. I was sure James had some kind of screen between those trees and that he had projected that image between them. Somehow, I just, I, I could not believe what I had just seen. Was it an actual craft? This had to be a joke. After I thoroughly investigated the area by myself, I returned to the gathering of people that were now huddled around the campfire, chatting about the night and things that they had witnessed. I approached James and, still shaking my head, tried to figure out what I was going to explain that I just saw. James met me with a charming, knowing smile. He smirked and then spoke up. Well... What did you see? I explained in detail to the best of my ability what had happened, and without missing a beat, James shook his head knowingly and informed me. Well, that's a half-biological, half-mechanical craft. It's how they get through the different dimensional rifts. He said it in a a very matter-of-fact kind of calm way, and I was thrown and thought to myself, man, I need to have a few tokes of what this cat is smoking. I mean, I had just seen the damn thing, and... And his understanding of the UFO made my brain melt. Now that they know that you're watching and that you've seen, they'll show themselves to you again. Welcome, Brother Dave. You're part of the club now. We all laughed and spoke for a bit, still casting our gaze upward in hopes of seeing something else. But nothing even close would be seen again that night. As I prepared to leave, I approached my gregarious host and said, What did you mean that they know I'm watching now? I mean, I'm I'm not in any danger, am I? I'm not going to be abducted or anything. They just know you're watching, man. Relax. You're safe. But if you keep watching, keep looking, they will reveal themselves to you as long as you're coming at it from a place of good. I said my goodbyes, shook hands, exchanged hugs, and returned to my motel room. I locked the door for the night, made sure it was secure, and slipped off to sleep. I was startled awake when I heard something move through my room, and the sound of my room door shut. I leapt from my bed, flipped on the light, and found the door closed and the locks open, the chain unhooked. I relocked everything and returned to bed, wide-eyed and out of breath. Nothing was missing from my room, and I was left wondering, after a weekend of observing, was I just the one being observed? I left that next day, after very little sleep, and returned three more times. Each time, the magical skies and property of the Assetti Ranch has never let me down. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from beyond the darkness. We are back, and Theater of the Mind was brought to you by Amazon. I am uh, psyched to be talking with somebody else that has had this experience and can actually understand it and relate to what is going on. We're talking about the Assetti Ranch in Trout Lake, Washington, and it is a magical place of mystery, wonder, and enigmas. You, you cannot put one title on this location. It's It's more than the UFO ranch. It's more than than a, a portal or a, a time slip spot. It, I, I cannot begin to really fully comprehend what it is we're dealing with. You just heard 
a real story, one of the most impactful stories I've ever had in my personal life. It opened up a whole new world of, of possibilities to me seeing this in the sky. Although I'd always believed in UFOs and the possibility to see something like this is life-changing. And it, it just opens up all of this amazing wonderment that's back in us. And, and I don't know about you, Jimmy. There's days where I start to get, I don't know, calloused over the, the topics that we cover. And I think, is there really anything left to talk about? Is there really, is there any real magic left? And then you have an experience like that and you see the things you see and you witness the things you witness. And, and it just, to me, it's like a real, it's somebody reaches down and shakes me and reminds me, Hey, you're not impressed. How about this? And then bam, I'm right back into it. It's the, Exactly. Uh, so I, I hit the cough button. We do that in radio. <laughs> so we, uh, we're we there. It's Thursday night. We just get there, and we're doing the sky watch, and we're having fun. Everything's good. And I'm sitting in the chair looking across the field. It's 11 o'clock at night, and in front of us, we keep re- referencing this this field. It's called Skywatch Field, and it, it I don't know, it's, it's, it's multiple acres. It's big, and uh, just this open field with grass. And uh, on the other side of the field is this bank of, of trees, just like in your photograph, uh, uh, your experience, and it's on the far side of the field. And I'm, I'm just you know, enjoying the moment. I'm looking at Mount Adams and on the far side of the field, this is what happens. And I'm just going to tell just like it went down Uh, from the, the out from the far side of the trees comes this gray splotch and it rises up out of the trees. And this is about a quarter mile away and I'm watching it and it curves to the left and then comes back to the right and stops. Now it goes from a tiny splotch, and it's on the far side of the field, quarter mile away. But it's probably 50 feet in diameter, and it's fuzzy, and it's gray, and it's an orb. And and it disappears. It lasts for about five seconds. Now, it looked like the orbs you see in photographs. It's 2D. It's flat. It's not curved. It's not a sphere. It's flat. Right. It's a splotch. It's a gray splotch. And as I watch this and it disappears, I'm thinking I've got a floaty in my eye or something. Right. So I kind of rub my eyes a little bit. I'm like, wow, that was that was that was weird. This lady at that exact moment standing in back of me says, is anybody watching that gray orb out there? And and I spin around and I looked at her and I said, you mean it's real. <laughs> That's what came out of my mouth. <laughs> and I turn back around. Now I'm uh, right. My mind is swimming. And I look back across and I hear everybody there. There's about 100 people all murmuring that gray orb. Did, did you see the gray orb? And I now look, everybody, I know it sounds like crazy talk. I know it sounds like the people that call in to Dave and I at Coast to Coast. I realize what I sound like at this moment. It doesn't change the experience, the reality of it. It happened. And that was on Thursday night. Now, meanwhile, like you're saying, Dave, and people are looking at the sky and they're looking at things moving around. But at that very moment, other things are going on at ESETI, to your left, to your right. There are people that are walking out, like my wife Rita, in the middle of the night, are walking out into the trees, you know, uh, you know, out to go experience things. And while they are out there, I'm over here watching a gray orb or something overhead. They come back with their story. So we're out in the woods, man. And, and this, this, this orange light was dancing through the trees and we went to go chase it and then it disappeared. You're like, <laughs> stop, man. It's just too much. It's crazy. It is. Um, and if you, if you have the opportunity, and you've heard about ESETI, and you have the opportunity to go, go. Don't waste your time. Just go. It will be one of your great life experiences, and then you'll be able to go back and sound like the crazy person like Dave and I do right now. 
It is so much fun, and you can't, it, it's, oh, 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 and then, okay, so as if that isn't enough, right? So we've got this door, and, and we're photographing the door over the next four days, and it's still there, and and uh, uh, the lights on Mount Adams, all of this stuff is going on. Lorcan O'Toole is up there with this. Lorcan O'Toole is the son of actor Peter O'Toole. His only child, right? Lorcan O'Toole. Looks just like Peter, younger version. Talks like him. Great guy to hang out with because you're hanging out with Peter O'Toole, the young version, right? right. <laughs> and a cool dude, very educated. As you can imagine, you know, just a very intelligent, uh, very cool, very fun, uh, spirited person. Very cool. And so we come back and uh, in the morning. And uh, we we arrive, and as we park our car, uh, he comes running up. He goes, man, last night after you guys left, I saw Bigfoot. <laughs> now, imagine the British Peter O'Toole saying, <laughs> and uh, what? And he goes, it happened right here, right where you just parked. It came out, he came out, uh, we parked next to this white van. And, uh, and he goes, it came out from in front of this white van. I was like, what? It was t- just as tall as the van. It was eight foot tall. So he goes through this whole, ex- we go back, um, into Eseti and I said, okay, start from the beginning. And he tells us the story and he's walking out the end of sky watch and he's going to walk this lady back to her tent. And he says to her, you know, I'm going to walk you back because you never know, you know, we might run into Bigfoot. So that's their little story. And they walk out and they hear, woo, woo, woo. And they stop and they back up a couple of steps. And then they hear it again, woo, woo, woo. And out in front of the van, he takes a couple of steps back, is an eight foot tall Bigfoot, full, full from the, they see everything. And he's kind of hunched over, walking gorilla like, which was weird. And he says he turns around and looks at them, and they have a moment for a couple of seconds. And then one of the uh, younger people there, I was going to say kid, he's probably 15 years old, uh, volunteer. He's sleepwalking with a flashlight. And he comes up and he's muttering uh, in an, uh, unintelligible words. He's literally sleepwalking with this lit flashlight. And Lorcan goes up to him to shut off the flashlight. What are you doing? He realizes that he's sleepwalking. They turn back to Bigfoot and he's gone. And there you go. And, you know, and so anyway, back to my point, you hear this story, this encounter, this experience at ESETI. I'm not, you, all you want to do is just hear the details because you know that it happened. You know, you're not you're not there to uh, discredit or try to figure out if somebody's lying or trying to do a fantastic tale or whatever. No, I know that it actually happened, and I want to hear the I want to hear the story. And there you go, Lorcan O'Toole, and just an incredible, incredible young man. I don't know, he's probably thirty, thirty five years old. Uh, did his. Uh, you know, a lot of, you know, he's an actor. He's given up acting, and now he's on this this life's journey. So he's been all around the world. He's uh, shooting a documentary on paranormal experiences and 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 transformational things and UFOs. And, and he's out there right now going across the planet and putting this documentary together. He is no longer an actor. I brought him on the show uh, last week uh, uh, to uh, to interview, and I said, "So, uh, acting. So, what's up next for you?" He goes, "Dude, I'm done with that. That's that's just stupid to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's reality, man. I'm not I'm not into that anymore. I'm I'm off doing this other thing. How cool is that? And he went up to East City and didn't leave. You know, he went up there to film and. He ended up uh, staying for uh, over a month. Uh, just, just you don't it, want to leave. I, I admit that every time I've been there, the experiences I have make you want to stay, make you want to see what what comes next. And that place, again, there has to be a logical explanation. There has to be. There what, has to be. What is oh. going on there? Do you think this is <laughs> is it rich in in geomagnetic principles? Is it is it causing mind disturbances? Is it uh, a portal 
what do you think could really be going on there that there's that much strange activity taking place in one area? It, it, well, let's let's look at the, yeah, again, let's look at the area as a whole. First off, 13 miles away, you've got a volcano. Okay? Right there, electromagnetic uh, uh, rocks, granite, underground movement things. Okay, so you have that. You have the power of massive amounts of electricity, heat, voltage, uh, the possibility of it being a ley line and something else, you know, that, that could be connecting to other parts of the world. Okay, so you, that that is an obvious thing. The Indians there, the Yakima Indians, it's a massive Indian reservation. They have been attracted to this place, you know, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So you have that element thrown in. Um, the area itself of East SETI, where it sits, the magic of this, these different spots on this ranch where you can go and see things, I think uh, they are whatever they may be, whether it's ghosts or appar- apparitions or or spirits or fairies. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that again. Um, are attracted to this place, and then you spin the ultimate thing on top, where you have uh, a collection of dozens, if not hundreds, of like-minded people getting together at the same spot asking for these connections so there's a very positive vibe that goes on there there's no negativity at eSETI it's just it's it's not there right there's I, I if somebody got negative there i think they would run them off you know so i don't know how you could be there's such a positive right. feeling it, again it's, it's strange it transcends when you're there i can i can think of very few times in my life i felt so calm and at peace i uh it's, well, it's bonkers. I, I apologize for cutting you off. No, because what you, what you just said happened the instant that I got there. When we were driving up, we flew, you know, from Los Angeles up. So we've been traveling all day and and dealing with the the things that you do with your traveling. And I'm tired and and I uh, my whole focus there. Uh, because we met friends in Portland, we got a, a couple of cars, and then we drove to East City. And you know, now it's in the middle afternoon. I'm tired, and all I'm thinking about is I want to get to the hotel and take a nap, and then get a, a shower, clean clothes, and then get over to East City for dinner, which was at 7 p.m. So that was my plan, right? And I'm I'm exhausted. I get to East City, put my feet on the ground, and I'm like recharged. Uh, my head is clear. I'm happy. I'm in a great mood. The whole focus that I had had about taking a nap, taking a shower, clean clothes, coming back, that was my plan. None of that happened. I get to East City. I'm running around like I'm five years old. I felt great. Went all the way through to two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it was just like, wow, what a magical place. It just recharged. And so when we left on Monday, uh, it was, I was, I was forlorn. I was, I was sad. And we get back to Los Angeles and, and, uh, we're going through the airport and I swear on everything that is holy. Rita and I go, you know what? Let's just fly back. <laughs> we're here at the airport. Let's just screw the show, screw life. Forget everything. This reality here of Los Angeles is just not appealing right now. We have our dogs. We have our kids. We, you know, that we wanted to come back and see if our dogs and kids only knew the truth, what, what the parents were talking about. <laughs> Go through the airport. Ah, the kids can feed themselves. The dogs will get it worked out. Let's get on a plane <laughs> and get dogs back. Will get it easy. worked out, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> it really happened, man. And and you're absolutely right. Uh, we uh, have immediately uh, started making plans uh, to get back to East City as soon as possible. So we're looking at uh, 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 the end of August, early September. Um, and, but yeah, we are definitely 100% getting back as soon as we can. We have so many events that we're doing right now. We've got uh, this event we're doing up in Mount Shasta with a Corey Good. So we've got that in, uh, coming up here soon. 
Uh, of, of course, there's Coast to Coast, there's Fade to Black, there's History Channel. All of this stuff is happening at the same time. So the first opportunity that we have is uh, uh, the last week of August, first week of September. And then, so <clears throat> check this out. We we have been planning, uh, and I'm sure you're going to be a part of this, of course, uh, a Fade to Black you know, get together, right? Where we just get the audience members together. Uh, we throw these very famous parties around the country and they are, the fader knots are just amazing. And so we want to, you know, do a, a fade to black conference and, you know, get together, you know, two, three hundred of the, the fader knots at one place. And, but we just couldn't figure out the location. We didn't know if it was going to be in Manhattan, if it was going to be in Miami or maybe Los Angeles, uh, we were thinking of these different places. Now we know it's going to be at ESETI. It has to be. There isn't a cooler place to get everybody together and just to make sure that we just have a, a magical time. And, and that's, that's where we're going to do it. Uh, there's no question in my mind where this needs to happen. It's at ESETI. Count me in, and I'd be happy to get back there and, uh, and be a part of that world. And I know we've got a lot of the, uh, Army of Darkness, it'll be happy to join you out there as well because they've been wanting us to go out and do something at Isetti, and uh, it, well, it know, might be time. You know what? Your fans and our fans uh, all say the same thing. Uh, you know, you you and Dave need to do something together. You guys are are really really cool, and we share a large fan base that has the same attitude. Uh, you know, they're very cool, they're very fun, and they question everything. And that's, you know, and, and that, that crossover uh, that we have is, is, is just extraordinarily cool. And I, I, I constantly hear it. I hear it from your fans and I hear it from ours that we need to do something together and we should. Um, oh, 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 oh. I, I can't let this thought get away from me. Okay. You said that you stayed off campus at a motel, which yes. means there, there's only one. Right. Right. So it's the trap late <laughs> in, right? Uh, it was called the, uh, yeah, Trout Lake, yeah, something or other inn or Trout Lake Lodge or whatever it was, right? Is that thing the, uh, the Twin Peaks Motel? Oh. Or what? No doubt. Is that, is that the David Lynch? Now, see, <laughs> so we get that we're, we're huge like everybody, right? Big, big Twin Peaks fans and we love everything David Lynch does. And we get there. And walk in, and I felt like I was Kyle McLaughlin on Twin Peaks walking into the room. It, it Now, it's not just like it. It is Twin Peaks, right? It's like crazy. The motif, the India motif, the furniture, the, and it's, it's, it's extraordinarily, I just said extraordinarily twice in 30 seconds, uh, uh, clean, upscale, beautiful, Really, really, really nice place, but it is Twin Peaks. So you combine <laughs> East City with the craziness, right, and the fun, and then you're staying at the uh, David Lynch uh, Motel, and it just added to the experience. It was <laughs> uh, next time around, though, we're going to stay at East City. I want to sleep there. I'm wondering what happens to your dreams. Yeah, I, I haven't had that kind of balls yet, uh, quite yet, Jimmy. I, I wanted oh. to as well, but I was like, you know what? But I, I will tell you, uh, I had a very unique experience when I went there and stayed at the the um, at that hotel. I remember thinking, you know, because James is big on once. You've seen them. Once they know you're watching, they'll make themselves known to you more. Right. And I said, so, James, does that mean I'm going to get abducted? Am I going to have an experience like that? And he just kind of shrugged. He would never give me an answer. So I was very unnerved by that aspect of the story. I'm like, all right, whatever. Jimmy, no kidding you. That first, I think it was the second night after I saw the lights in the sky, I came home exhausted. It was such an emotional roller coaster to see all of this stuff. And like you said, it's so overwhelming and the energy is so overwhelming there. So I'm, I get back to the room. I crash hard and I can usually sleep pretty good through the night. I've got kids. So when something is upsetting in the room, something's off, I'll wake up. Well, I woke up out of the blue to the sound of my door shutting my, oh. my motel room door shutting. And I, I sat there and I'm like, what the hell was that? Because I'm meticulous. When I go into a hotel room, 
on goes the chain, boom goes the deadbolt, whatever right. I can. I've got piled up in front of that chair because I, you know, I'm a paranoid man. So right. I, I go and I look. The, the, uh, chain is off the door. The deadbolt is unlocked. Something just left my room. I know it did. And there was no other exit, no other way for it to get in and out of my room. My windows were shut and locked. I don't know what the hell just happened, but I know that it was locked and shut and chained when I went into that room. Yeah. Yeah. You got to remember who you're talking to right now. Right. <laughs> I, I get it. And I know that it happened. We arrived uh, uh, Thursday night. We get back uh, to the hotel, which is just a mile away. Right. It's just, you know, I, you know, and you pull in. It's, it's right there. And we we uh, uh, go into our room, uh, put our stuff down. We walk back outside just to uh, and it's one o'clock in the morning just to breathe the air and just collect our thoughts before we went in and, and camped. And we're standing there. And it's black, right? It's just black. There's, it's just beautiful. And all of a sudden, a wolf started howling, right? And and it's right in front of us in the trees somewhere. And as it howls, then off to, this is like front and center, off to our left, out into the trees, another wolf starts howling, then off to the right, and then another and another and another. And in about 10 seconds, there was a hundred or 200 wolves howling like a choir at ear splitting volume. And it just rose up. And I looked at Rita. I said, this place is cool. Listen to that. <laughs> so we got back uh, to East Eddie the next day and it was loud. And then it died down. It lasted for about 15 or 20 seconds. They all said hello to each other, you know? So we get back to East Eddie the next morning and uh, we roll in. I said, hey, man, uh, anybody hear the wolves last night? Oh, yeah, it was great. And I, I, I you know, and it's just like I said, you, you pile all of this stuff on. It's just one experience after another. Just just it, it, it never stopped. It, it didn't stop for four days. It was. Uh, <laughs> Have they reported anything, Jimmy? I haven't caught up with James in a long time, but ha- has there been any reports of abductions or anything of the negative ilk that have, that's taken place in and around the property? Nothing, nothing at all. And what uh, it's funny that you bring that up because um, I'm apparently on Thursday night, because I was on the radio with James on Friday or was it Saturday? It must have been Friday night on Coast to Coast. Yeah, it was Friday, open lines. Some lady called in with George and said that she was up at East Eddie Ranch a couple of years before. She was up there with, uh, well, it doesn't matter. And that these ships showed up. Uh, I, I didn't hear the episode. I didn't hear this uh, conversation with George. But uh, it was relayed to me, uh, you know, with uh, 20 emails and comments and people coming up to me. She said that everybody was killed, abducted. There was things going on with children in the conference center and they burnt that down and they drugged everybody and, and there were no survivors and somehow she survived. And two years later, she remembered everything. So she calls in to George with this story, right? Now it's entertainment people. First off, all right. It was somebody calling in just trying to, you know, I, I doubt in any way that, any of this happened or some kind of implanted memory. I just think it was somebody trying to, uh, <clears throat> you know, see how far they could take the story on a phone call at coast. So, but I turned to James, James tells me uh, about all of this. And I go, well, dude, the conference center's right there. And so I take a picture of it. Right? <laughs> Suppose, uh, obviously it didn't burn down. And, and I said, so James, you know, uh, where are all the bodies buried? And he's just laughing and he, and he says, out of all the places in the world that you could say something negative about, it would be this place <laughs> because this is this is Happyville, right. right? This is Happyville, you know. And it's it's nothing negative. I can't imagine. I went up to uh, I went up to Ashley there, and I said, "What do you guys do when you report a crime?" She goes, I don't know. We take care of it ourselves. We don't have police. I said, really? There's no sheriff? She goes, no. 
no, there's only 550 people here in this town. No, we have we have no police. You know, there's no 911. There's nothing. We take care of everything ourselves. She goes, but I'll say this. Everybody here at Trout Lake knows everybody else. And I know you hear that kind of statement a lot, but here, truly, everybody knows everybody, and there are no troublemakers. So there you go. I I don't think uh, anything strange has happened up there like that in, in a negative sense. And I tried to you know, ask my little questions about that, you know, uh, you know, David Pallades and missing 411, you know, you guys got a Sasquatch walking around here and uh, E.T. and abductions, uh, anything. No, no, I, I could not could not get that question answered. Not in the way that I would have you know, thought, yeah, somebody was abducted once or somebody went missing and they were found. No, no, nothing, nothing strange on that side of things. That is, you know, during the episode that we filmed there with uh, Paranormal State, at one point when we were out there, um, you know, we'd heard these creatures and weird beings are supposed to roam the property. And while we were all stargazing, I believe it's Ryan who says something along the lines of, what the hell is that? He saw something go moving from the woods into this little kind of standalone clutch, this oasis of trees. So... I I jumped out of the truck. I said, well, let's go find out. And we started running towards it to to see what was out there. Half of me not expecting to find anything because I thought maybe he was just, it was a very slow moment. Maybe he's trying to get a little excitement in the episode. Let's, let's go check it. And let the old man be the first one leading the charge. Because as my listeners know, I'm not a fan of the out of doors. So to be the first one to run towards some kind of creature and uh, into the woods is not my normal uh, behavior. But right. I, I go all in ass in there, and I, sure enough, we get there, and there's some huge den. And you can see where th- things have – there's, like, branches down. There's needles. I mean, it's it looks as though somebody has made a giant bed in this little wooded area. And we did a quick walk around and then got the hell out of there very fast. But uh, that was – there is so much that takes place there, Jimmy. But you know what's really intriguing to me? Not far from there, when you're facing Mount Adams, if you were to turn around – uh, you know, 180 degrees off towards the direction I saw my alien craft or, or being or whatever the hell it was, there's a military base not that far away. That's where it starts getting really bizarre for me is if there's a military base that close to something like this going on and you've got James Gilliland out there and we've heard so many conspiracies, you and I, over the years of doing mm-hmm. shows like this and coast to coast. How has this guy, how has this property not been taken away? How has James not conveniently been offed, uh, you know, and the government swooped in and taken this property? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. The thing is, um, with that, first off, he would be a martyr. Right. I, 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 he's way too public with this, and it's it's been documented so much. But it went on before James was there. He's been there for 30 years, man, 30 years. Right. So this went on before James. It would go on after James. Uh, And there's a a little bit, there's a highway that goes by there. Even though Trout Lake is small, there's still plenty of residents there that all see the same thing, you know, that James sees every night. You know, it's not because it's just happening over East City. He's got neighbors to the left and right and, and in back and in front. And they are witnessing the same thing. Mount Adams is lit up for everybody. So I, I, I often wondered about, uh, you know, somebody coming in and shutting this place down and, you know, paying James off and buying the ranch and, and quieting things down. It wouldn't stop things. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree. He's had his share of black helicopters. Yeah. Uh, and they've got video footage and photographs of it. So again, it's not just some, claim there's actual video footage and photographs of these black helicopters tearing across and some of the fighter jets chasing after something on his property. And now I would, I do want to address a couple of things as uh, I know that we're drawing to a close uh, with this video that we have posted. Right. Uh, um, there uh, have been lots of comments. I get lots of email uh, a lot. Uh, I think right now, you know, the video's been up for a day and a half, and it's it's at a hundred thousand views now, uh, which is pretty good for a little paranormal little video that's popped up. Um, so with that comes a lot of skepticism, and you have to have that. You have right. to have 
objectivity. Uh, the overwhelming amount of comments, and there's a lot, uh, are saying, why don't you have a drone? Well, you know, what's stopping you from a drone? Okay, first off, and and they're asking for drones for high-def footage, that the footage that we have provided is blurry. Okay, everybody needs to understand, it's 13 miles away. Right. The <laughs> camera, the best telephoto lens, the best of everything. Go out in front of your house right now with your bad-ass Nikon, whatever you got, and photograph something 13 miles away and send it to me. Okay, because you're not going to see it. So remember that it's 13 miles away. Second, you're not going to fly up a drone from 13 miles away there. It's not going to happen. So, well, why don't you get closer? Okay, let's talk about that. It's an Indian reservation. There are no roads. There are no paths. There is nothing. It is certified government wilderness area slash Indian reservation. You would have to hike through miles of thick forest where there are no roads. Okay. So imagine doing that. So that's a two day hike just to get to the base of the mountain. Okay. There are no, you don't drive up to Mount Adams. Look at it on Google Earth. You will see you just don't do that. Now, next, even if you got to the base of the mountain with the, the largest multi rotor, not a quadcopter, one of those eight, you know, engined five foot diameter drone, you're going to now take that up to a ceiling of 13,000 feet to videotape this you are up in the most swirling winds imaginable and no matter what how sophisticated your drone is you've just lost it <laughs> okay it's now gone it, it will it, so it's it's not that simple it's not just why didn't you go up there and get close you cannot we were 13 miles away we did the best that we could plus we were taken completely by surprise we didn't go up there uh, planning on seeing this and then doing a hike. Third point that I want to drive home, you don't walk up to, this isn't a day hike uh, uh, up Mount Adams. That is a mountain climb. It is a sh it's a glacier covered in, it's, you know, it's covered in snow glacier first. Second, it's sheer volcanic faces on this. It is a serious mountain climb by a professional mountain climber, of which my 53-year-old fat body of mine is not a, a mountain climber. So all of these things need to be addressed directly. You're just not going to uh, walk up there and go up to a ranger or go up to the Indians there and go, hey, can I can I walk through here with my drone? I want to go check out the UFO door. It's it's not going to happen. So we will uh, uh, eventually get to something where we can make this happen. We got to you know we got to lease a plane. We got to rent a plane. We got to rent a helicopter. I wouldn't want to do it in a helicopter, but uh, and and fly up there. Or we need some type of military drone. You know something with a ten foot wingspan. Uh, to fly around up there. It's not going to be your little DGI phantom. <laughs> no, that's, that's not uh, what, what can and will happen. It just, that, that's an impossibility. But we have something to investigate. Just like you said, Dave, it now is there. It's real. It's, it's uh, tangible. This isn't imaginary. And we have something really cool and incredible to go and get the answers to. And that's what life is all about. So there you go. So when you watch the video and you see it, I, I hope that I answer those questions. There isn't a crisp and clear photograph because we shot it from 13 miles away. Right. We did the best that we could. Uh, but it's there, and uh, we will uh, eventually, uh, with your help and your listeners and us, uh, and everybody else that has come into play, we will uh, get this thing uh, uh, figured out, and and it will be sooner than later. We know where it is. Well, it's it's always a pleasure talking with you, Jimmy. And I don't know. As in closing, did you have a takeaway? See, my takeaway was twofold. I had a very cool experience that that transcends my experience. There was the fact that I was able to go on my way home. 
I'm, I'm just having this replay in my mind over and over again, as James has told me that now that you've, you've opened up to this, they're going to make themselves known to you. So as I'm flying home and I'm, I'm in the sky, I look out my window and there off to my side is the Big Dipper. I can see it up in the sky. And I thought, you know, I've spent the last three nights watching you, seeing things fly around the skies up here. If, and I'm, I'm just thinking this to myself. I'm saying, if this is real, show me something now. Just show me something. And I'm looking out the window, Jimmy. And out of the sky comes this bright ball of white light that flies into the cup of the Big Dipper and stops. My face is as close to that glass as it can be. I'm up. I'm, I'm William Shatnering it from uh, Twilight Zone, looking out this window at this ball of light, thinking, "What? What is reflecting? What am I? What do I think I'm seeing here?" And all of a sudden, boom! It takes off like a bat out of hell in the opposite direction. And well, I'm my- looking around the plane. Everybody else is laying down, lights out. They're kind of relaxing. Nobody's looking out the side of this plane. But I just saw this with my eyes, and I come back home real quick, and I'll go back with you. I get back. I explain to my kids what what happened, and they were very excited. We want to go watch the skies, Dad. Let's go look at the skies. So we take a drive out to St. Francis, Minnesota, and um, to my ex in laws' house. And the kids are laying on the hood of the truck, and we're looking at the skies and watching for things to move and seeing what happens. And uh, all of a sudden, I hear, "Hey, Daddy, look, look!" And I come over, and my my nephew Braden and my uh, my daughter Pacey are laying on the hood of the car. Uh, or I'm sorry, uh, my daughter Kayla, and they're pointing to the sky. But they're pointing to two different points in the sky. And there are these two balls of light moving across the sky. And as soon as we're all watching them, they start to dance and twirl in the sky. Like they're making like a helix pattern in the sky. And they're zipping around, dancing about, and then boom, they both take off in different directions, and that was it. And we got to share that moment. But it was, you have to start watching. You And, and I firmly believe that. Now, once you are open... To the possibilities, they will make themselves known to you. Have you had a takeaway like that since you've since you've gotten back? Yes, a, a, a couple of things have happened, and the we only took two suitcases with us, right? Two uh, rollarounds. That's it, and we were missing a couple of things up there. And we come back, we packed. And we came back here and unpacked our stuff, and it was in. They were in the suit. Well, wait a minute. The suitcases were empty, and we filled them. Right. <laughs> so then we get back here, and Rita's makeup bag. She was so upset about it, couldn't find it, and it, it showed up in her drawer here. Now it was in Mount Adams with us, but it didn't make the trip back, and. If, 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 look, man, I can't, I can't <laughs> explain this kind of stuff. But the one, the solid takeaway that I really have is one of of relief. In that, uh, you go and you're searching through life, and you've had your things, and you, you know, you you're searching for answers and stuff. You you go to Mount Adams, and and when you leave, you just realize to yourself everything that I've I've questioned and I've wanted answers for and think they they tend to get answered there and you find out that there is something else going on one of wonderment and it's magic and it's it's leprechauns and rainbows and unicorns and you know this whole little thing uh, you find out that uh, confirmation inside of yourself Right, and you walk away, going, you know what? I'm cool. I'm cool with myself, and the negativity in the world, the things that are that are really bad out there, they t- they tend not to matter. You know, they tend not to matter as much. And you find out, and this is my takeaway: you walk around in life with like two suitcases with a uh, hundred pounds of books in each one, and they're heavy. And you're carrying them and, and you're trying to, you know, and you're struggling with each step. And then you find out that you just need to drop them. And then you can walk without the weight on you. And that's what happens. You drop the negativity down. Just let it go and, 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 and go and figure things out for yourself. And that's, that's my takeaway. And you become a much freer person and you realize that 
the negativity around you or maybe a friend of yours that is negative and, and those, those thoughts and those emotions, you just need to let those go. Life is way too short, man. There's yes. really, really cool things out there to go and, and discover for yourselves. Let that heavy stuff that, that's in each hand release the hands. Just let it go. And that's what, that's my takeaway. And with that, Dave, man, talking with you is just, just always totally awesomest of the awesome. And, uh, just thank you and everybody out there. The, uh, the, the Beyond the Darkness audience is so cool, and I know I'm going to get an email, and I look forward to that. Thank you, everybody, and, and Dave, thank you for everything that you do, my friend. And remind everybody how they can hear you, Jimmy, when they can keep up with you. Very simple, jimmychurchradio.com. Just go. Everything is there that you need. Uh, we broadcast for free. Everything is there and we have memberships and things that you can participate in, but that's, that's, you know, but they just, just come and find us, jimmychurchradio.com and, and you can take off from there. It's that simple. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. And remember, everybody, you get one more night with me. I'll be hosting Coast to Coast AM tomorrow night from midnight till 4 a.m. Central. You can find information and stations in your area times by visiting Coast to Coast AM dot com. Tomorrow night is a night of true crime. We'll be talking about the horrific McDonald's massacre that took place back in 1984 in the first two hours, plus your calls. And in the last two hours, we're going to be discussing a wrongfully convicted man and a story you have to hear. That's what we'll be covering on Coast to Coast AM. Thank you to Jim. Jimmy Church, and remember, we'll be back next week with Tim Dennis and a whole week of Beyond the Darkness.